Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Mitch Light of The Athletic. We thank our presenting sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center. Wellspire offers personal and professional development opportunities in a beautiful facility in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host an off-site event that will allow your team or your clients. Thank you also to our co-presenting sponsor, the Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. Today's news is presented by our friends at Sutherland and Belk, a Nashville-based injury law firm. Sutherland and Belk is committed to fighting for those who have been injured in car, motorcycle, and truck accidents. Check them out at sbinjurylaw.com. The NFL draft has concluded. Keyshawn Vaughn goes in round three to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. No other Commodores selected, although Jared Pinckney goes to the Falcons in free agency and Kalijah Lipscomb in free agency to the Chiefs. Our guest line is presented by Bolin Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. Had no idea what I was missing until I got Bolin Branch sheets. They are fair trade certified, meaning they are made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them free for a month. You can return them, but you won't want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted the best mattress of 2018. Go to BowlingBranch.com. That is spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Mitch Light is with us now. Mitch, of course, at The Athletic these days. He is also the sideline reporter for Vanderbilt Football. Mitch, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Happy to talk with you, Chris. Hope you're doing well. I am. Let's talk NFL draft. What surprised you on the Vanderbilt end of things, or what did you make of the weekend, and anything else that's draft-related that caught your eye? Um, I was, uh, I guess, pleasantly surprised to see Keyshawn Vaughn go in the third round. And uh, I saw, you know, you probably saw some of my tweets. I saw some of your correspondence with people out there. I think we are in the same camp. A little bit surprised that he was, his projections were fifth, sixth round or fourth, fifth, sixth round. You know, I kind of trust, especially with that position, I kind of trust my eyes. You know, I can't sit here and tell you about an offensive lineman or even, you know, line, you know, other positions are more difficult, but you could kind of tell that, you know, when healthy that, that Keyshawn Vaughn had. As you know, elite talent. And I was watching the draft. You know, I watched the whole draft every every round. But I got up to to do some dishes or something when in the third round. And then I heard a pick come in. I said, you know what? I just have a weird feeling that, that Keyshawn, not necessarily at that spot, that he was going to go higher than everyone thought. So I kind of turned off the water, walked into the kitchen or walked into the TV room, and so I saw that pick. So it. Seems like a great fit. Uh, you know, if you're going to be a rookie running back on a good team, that's probably the best place to go this year with what else they have at that position. Um, was not shocked. Uh, I was mildly surprised that Pinckney was not drafted. Wasn't really that surprised that Lipscomb, I would have, you know, if they were both taken the seventh round, sixth round, I wouldn't have, you know, been surprised either way. I, I thought Pinckney was a little more, you know, on my my board that doesn't exist. Pinckney probably would have been a little bit higher up. Um, but one thing, and Joe Rexroad wrote this in his column, uh, he kind of a, a notes column type thing. And I didn't realize this, that, that Pinckney's 40 time was the lowest at the combine of among the top 25 tight ends and stuff. So I didn't, I guess I didn't pay close enough attention that he didn't really test well at the combine there. So I guess that's obviously hurt him a lot. I think he's got a chance to make, uh, the, an NFL roster at some point. So, um, I guess one guy goes a little higher and then two guys go maybe a little bit lower than we thought. I will circle back to Lipscomb and Pinckney next, but I don't know how many better landing spots Keyshawn Vaughn could have gotten. First of all, the competition there, I believe Peyton Barber has been traded or signed elsewhere. He was Tampa's backup running back. He was backing up Ronald Jones Jr., who is frankly – one of the worst starting running backs in the league. Last year averaged 4.2 yards a carry, averaged 1.9 in his rookie year. Does it – well, I guess he did catch 31 balls last year, so more there than I thought. But Ronald Jones Jr. is not one of the most highly regarded starting running backs out there. I think Keyshawn's a better player. Keyshawn also – 
can catch passes. That's something that Tampa is going to value. That's something Tom Brady does a lot is throw to the running back. And there was a tweet by Bruce Arians. I don't remember who tweeted this. You probably saw this, Mitch. But talking about how he is basically Bruce Arians' kind of player that he likes a three-down back, and it sounds like they think of him that way, I have not researched all 32 teams to say that's the best landing spot, but the combination of opportunity and players around him, they've got Mike Evans, they've got Gronkowski. My goodness, it's just harder to dream up a better scenario. Nothing they give him, but I think he's got a wonderful opportunity there and almost certainly is going to be, I think, their backup running back. You know, at, not, at a if minimum, not, if not a starter. Yeah, at a minimum, I think it's probably, if you want, if you combined opportunity and quality of team now they've got to go out and prove it you know they're kind of there's we see that a lot in sports the nfl team hot teams in the off season but if you're if you uh want to combine uh like i said opportunity and the quality of team i don't think you could find a better landing spot we all thought the titans would be a really good fit and the titans would have been a good fit for him to be the backup running back but but for him to to um to be a primary back or at least a you know a 50 50 split or something like that uh, i think uh, absolutely ideal Pinkney, I'm with you. I was a little bit surprised he didn't kick pick. I was not shocked. Of course, he signed a free agent contract with the Falcons. Like you said, the combine numbers were awful. He didn't produce as a senior. I don't think his blocking grades were very good. He's a guy that, if he's motivated, all he can really do is go up from here. Yeah, and uh, you know he, uh, I, you know, wake up call is not the right term I you know maybe just uh you know um uh, just kind of I don't even know what I'm trying to say the, the realization that you know it didn't work out you know at this point last year maybe you know he probably you, you can debate this a lot you know the fact that some people projected him first or second round last year that he would not have been a first or second rounder if he came out last year you know he the the, the workouts and the combine they expose your weaknesses and he had a good junior year he made he was a primary target on a pretty good offensive team um but so then you know coming back i'm sure it was a disappointing season you you could being around him you could see his frustration and all that so maybe just now just kind of a fresh start uh will, will do him well um because obviously it didn't go as he planned, but he definitely has the ability to catch the ball. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't sit here and tell you, I know the Falcons depth chart at tight end, uh, but but I would be surprised if, if Pinkney does not, you know, play, uh, make an NFL roster at some point. Are draft projections for the NFL a year out the most inaccurate of all the major sports? Because, I've seen a bunch of times where a guy was picked as a first rounder, sometimes a high first rounder. I remember seeing Tyler Bray, number one overall on some board somewhere. Now, this was like two years out. I remember Jevin Sneed was a first rounder. He didn't get picked, neither did Bray. It just seems like mock drafts a year in advance, unless you are maybe just a, a franchise quarterback at the Peyton Manning level or maybe just a stud lineman. It just seems like those are just so hard to forecast. Yeah. And I, I think the people that do them know that as well. Like I've heard Todd McShay on, on podcasts and, and Dane Brugler, who does them for the, he does a really good job for us for the athletic. They kind of make fun of themselves that like they're asked to do it. So they do it. And, you know, I, someone like Pinkney, I, I, I can see, you know, saying something like, Oh, he's catches Pat. He's big. He's fast. He's, you know, he, catching passes down the field. He's made got good hands and stuff. That looks, you know, I, we were probably guilty of this on podcast. He looks like an NFL, you know, tight end, and he, you know, our second or third round pick. But we're, what we don't know is how good of a blocker is he really? What are his times going to be? How's he going to test? How's he going to do in interviews and stuff like that? So, um, you know, I, I think. The draft people do a good job. It's very difficult, but you're right. We, we, a year out, like they're not really studying. All, all the, the the hardcore you know draft people they're studying the draft eligible guys they're not really st- you know although you could P- Pinkney could have come out last year so I don't want to contradict myself but he wasn't really on people's radar heading into last season. I'm not a scout, but the way I look at things is I look at how you produced and if there's something glaring like your quarterback and your arms not strong enough or your receiver and you drop a ton of balls. I mean to me. 
you are, for the most part, the player that you show you are on film. To me, the combine is not as, I guess, telling in terms of the kind of player you will be, at least not in the way that people ascribe weight to it, I guess, is a good way to put it. But to me, the combine and, and I'll give you an example. You've seen the Titans fall in love with guys who ran well at the Combine in the past decade or so. This was before John Robinson, and a lot of those guys bust. That's usually the way that I look at it. The guys that put up good Combine numbers but don't have the production are guys I'm going to stay away from. To me, the Combine is find the red flags and shed some light on the things that we don't know about, and that's where I think Pinckney got killed. And to me, that's where I thought that, like, if you run a 5-0 flat or whatever he was clocked at, I think that's where those numbers are fair to evaluate. And I just think that in terms of guys that I've covered, I don't know that anybody at Vanderbilt has hurt himself more with his combine than the Jared Pinckney. Yeah, I mean, that's fair, I think. And, you know, neither of us do this, you know, scouting <laughs> and drafting for for – a living, but what you're looking to avoid is being on the 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 far end, uh, or you know, the, you you don't be an outlier. Like he was an outlier with it with the time he ran. You know, if you, you if you run a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second too slow, and you go from want to run a four six to a four eight, that's one thing. But you don't want to be at the bottom end there. So um, again, you know, he we might look back in two or three years, and he might be having a solid NFL career, and look back and say he should have been drafted higher. Um, but and you and you, you and I have talked about this too. That there's extenuating circumstances with everything, but and if you're try, trying to poke holes in his collegiate resume, he really only had one productive season. He was a disappointment his sophomore year, had, you know, concentration issues, dropped too many passes. And then then obviously we know about the struggles this year, uh, but still had a disappointing year. So it wasn't like he was a consistent producer or, you know, performer throughout all four of his years. Yeah, and that's why when I did the Vandy Sports 100, I left him just outside it. In fact, I had him 101. <laughs> that might have even been a little bit generous for the reasons that you say – Lipscomb, I was never sold on him being a fourth, fifth round pick or whatever people were saying a year ago. Receiver is a supply and demand position where there's a ton of good ones. Lipscomb looks good because he's advantageable. He's one of the top ones they've ever had. But this is an era where receivers are a dime a dozen. It was an incredibly good year at the top. He did not have a good year last year. Again, not his fault. Actually, I think he did well at the things he could control, like blocking and things like that at times and route running. That's where he drew high marks. But he also had that stretch where he took himself out of the UNLV game or whatever that was, didn't play the South Carolina game. Those are two things that were held against him. And he would draw stupid personal foul penalties at times here and there. I don't think that probably helped him as teams dug in on his resume. Now, having said that, he is a competitor. I think he will play hard. Uh, but I think there's a little bit of growing up maybe there that needs to happen. I think those are all things that maybe hurt him. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think he's a very good college receiver. But you mentioned, you know, there's so many – the way teams throw the ball now, there's so many productive receivers out there and so many, you know, um, you, just just really good college receivers. And I, I do think he probably, you know, we, we're not there for the interviews or in the combine and all that, but I do think he hurt himself. I mean, if you're a borderline draft draftable prospect, you don't want to be a guy that had some, some of those issues that he had this past year. And you mentioned that I, don't, I never thought enough people made enough about this personal fouls. I, you know, he, I think it was three straight games. He had personal fouls, um, and I think it was the, the Missouri game, his junior year had a huge one that killed the drive when Vanderbilt was, you know, lost or one, ended up being a two score game, but it was a close game. Uh, just lost his cool too many times. Uh, you know, that goes to the maturity issues and, you know, it's not necessarily averaged, you know, 16.5 his sophomore year, but last two years averaged 10.5 in, in 10.9 yards production, uh, per reception. So I think a really good college receiver that who's going to have a tough time making an NFL roster. Like here's a good. Trent Sherfield, who we never, you know, you don't really consider them in the same class as receiver because Lipscomb had was, you know, had much better. His one great year was much better. But I'm not I don't know if, you know, is, is Lipscomb better than Sherfield, who, who made an NFL roster? Uh, I don't know. Well, Lipscomb had a better career. Sherfield, if you remember, just had a dismal sophomore year. All the drops just really completely lost his confidence. Of course, with Trent, he was also transitioning from safety, 
whereas Kalijah Lipscomb had been a receiver the whole time. So it's not apples to apples. I think the difference in the two, I thought Trent Sherfield was one of the more thoughtful and mature kids that I've dealt with. And I always say that I will bet on a kid with marginal talent 10 times out of 10. I remember writing this when he was a senior. I said, I think that Sherfield will end up making the NFL just because of his intangibles. And I think he will do whatever. I think he will go to places. He will be a kid who turns heads with his work ethic and the way that he conducts himself. Now, look, that was, I'm not going to say it was throwing spaghetti against the wall. Sometimes you make a lot of picks and you tend to cite the ones you remember and maybe not the ones that you missed on. But my point was, I think that he stuck for all the reasons that I thought he would. And to me, that's the difference in those two kids. Yeah, just look this up. And Lipscomb's junior year was 87 catches for 916 yards. It's not a great average there. And Sherfield's senior year was 50 catches for 729, much better average, you know, 415 yards per catch there. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll find out. Hope, hope Kalaja, you know, makes it. It's going to be a tough spot, obviously, in Kansas City because they've got such a good offensive team. Um, but, uh, you know, I think he's a guy that did a lot of things well. I don't know if he did one thing great. Did you realize he only had three career 100-yard games? Uh, no. I, you know, I – Hundred yard receiving games are are more frequent than you would think. You know, just someone yeah. at Athlon for years and years looking at stats. It's just it's um, not easy. I mean, there's more thousand yard rushers than receivers and stuff. But you're right with a guy who had a, a 916 yard junior season and you know got over 500 yards in two other seasons. You, you would think he'd have more. His role changed a lot over his career because his sophomore year. He was a legit deep threat. I remember Kyle Shermer just throwing the ball up to him a few times late in the season, and he and Trent Sherfield would just go get it and make these huge plays. The next year, he was more of a possession-type guy. You mentioned the yards per catch. And, of course, last year was just a disaster across the board. But the sophomore to junior thing was the thing that I never really understood. It seems like they intentionally used him very differently, and I never – I guess I should have asked, but I never understood why. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to. I mean, the, the offense was better his junior year, so it wasn't like it hurt. You know, wasn't like the offense got. You know, maybe was that the year that that uh, uh, Caleb Scott was healthier, and you know they, they had more, they had more options that year. I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. Um, but I, I do want to say Lipscomb has very good hands. I don't want to sell him short. He made some very difficult catches uh, in traffic. Uh, to, you know, even his last game of his career made a really good catch in the end zone. Uh, the, the last offensive touchdown of the season for Vanderbilt. So I don't want to, you know, uh, downplay some of the really good things he did. He he had some really he, he had good hands for uh, a wide receiver. Yeah, and look, we're talking about 22-year-old kids. I know 22, I was not the most mature kid. He's got a lot of time to rectify that. I think some things in his corner, I think he runs pretty good routes according to people who follow those things. I've seen this myself. I think he's a really, really – competitive kid I I kept watching he and Jawan Williams go at it in practice I thought those two were going to get into a fist fight a couple of times that tells me something about him I think the contract was interesting because Kansas City has got five pretty good receivers and I guess you usually carry five or maybe six to me he is hoping to get that number six role within usually the receiver that fits that is going to have to play a lot of special teams he barely did that at all the last two years According to Pro Football Focus, he had five total special team snaps between the last two years. And as a sophomore, I think he had about 120-something reps on special teams. So he's done it before. But it's interesting because the Chiefs, a team that won to five, are about as good at receiver as anybody in the NFL. Yet at the same time, they offered him a guaranteed contract with, I think, $100,000 that he gets regardless So that tells me if you're going to sign a guy to a contract like that, in that kind of situation, there's something about him that you really value that you think he's got a good shot to make the team. Yeah, good points. I did not realize he had to get that money guaranteed. You know, that's that's not a bad first year salary for anyone out of college if he doesn't do anything else. So good for him. And, you know, to your point, too, about his competitiveness. I think that is I think he's a very competitive kid. I think sometimes over there's a line that he crossed and that's why he got some of those penalties. But you know, to, he he's a kid that wants it. You know, I, his desire to be good is there. Uh so he does have a lot of things going for him. 
Okay, a couple more things before we get to the mailbag. Wait, did you buy your uh, Riley Neal uh, Broncos jersey yet? <laughs> I have not gotten that. That was a surprise. And speaking, yeah. I'm glad you said that. He signed a contract with the Broncos. Justin, Justice Shelton Mosley called on with the Chiefs. I did not catch if anybody else has signed a deal. I forgot to check. No, Donald's in a release just saying that those those were the four guys that did. And, you know, people wondering how Riley could, Neal could get a contract. And, you know, we always hope it works out for everyone. When you're 6'6 six, six and you got a, a big arm, you're, someone's going to give you a chance. So, you know, I'm not surprised that he, you know, he'll get a shot in camp. From what we saw last year, you know, his ability to see the field, decision making obviously needs to needs to improve. Uh, I think we'd all be surprised, very surprised if he made it. I'm not surprised he's, he'll be in a camp. Yeah, I'm not shocked by that either, but I, I'd almost forgotten about him. Yeah. Okay, Kerwin Walton committed to North Carolina today. Not a shock. I think the rumor, and who knows? I don't know how much actual info anybody had. He was thought to be choosing between Minnesota and and UNC Vanderbilt got under the commitment, I think, after we did our last podcast yeah. last week from a post guy that we talked about. Any thoughts on basketball and the happenings of the last week? Not really. I mean, you know, uh, it's interesting. How do you pronounce the name? Is it Odisepi? Akeem Odisepi? I think I'm, it's I'm, that or Odisepe is how okay. I would probably pronounce it, but that doesn't mean okay. it's right. It's funny. He had some pretty good offers. Um, you know, West Virginia was one of his final, you know, but some decent power five offers. Um, I remember Brad Frederick once telling me, though, former Vanderbilt assistant who's now in North Carolina, there's nothing more over, and this isn't a shot at this Keem kid at all, but there's nothing more over recruited than a big man in the spring. It's just, he said, if I ever have a kid, my kid who's a basketball player and he's over six, eight, he's not signing until the spring because everyone needs big guys. But it looks like Keem's a you know a kid who you know plays hard, good defensive player, good rebounder, and stuff like that. You know, obviously it's always good to add size there. So uh, you know, it seems like a pretty good spring signing. I was listening to Gary Parish on a podcast today. I was listening to one that was a few days old. It was about the Harms kid from Purdue committing to BYU and about how his recruitment was just pretty nuts this spring because of the supply and demand. And yeah. he compared it to like. The prettiest girl at the bar, she might not be that pretty overall, but <laughs> if she's the prettiest one at the bar that night, uh, the market for the, that kind of thing uh, goes up. And that was kind of the analogy that he made with Harms. I think that also holds uh, for your analogy with post players in the spring period. Yeah, well, why just, you know, I, I with this age of everyone transferring, but I bet the 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 uh, the rate of big men who sign in the spring transferring down is is higher. I cannot remember this kid's name. We're going back probably ten years, but there's a kid who maybe signed with Rice early, then decommitted. He was from Lexington, Kentucky, and Vanderbilt was in on him. A bunch of schools were in on him. He was like a six eight kid who kind of grew late, and I was convinced it was going to be you know, a great find and all this stuff. He ended up signing with Butler, could not get off the bench, and I could then transferred some low major. So that's just one one case, and that's when the line, that's when when Brad Frederick gave me that line because I think I texted him or emailed him and said, "Oh, that so and so kid looks pretty good," and he's just like, you know, not really. <laughs> you know, I didn't. It was one of those where I, I think Vanderbilt fans were disappointed that he didn't come here for guy's name, and I at the end I don't even know if Vanderbilt offered him. It's one of those things in recruiting. Half the time we don't even know. The, the complete story about things. Yeah, those things get a life of their own, and sometimes the offer list does not come close to matching a reality. <laughs> what, yeah. what happens in standing offers? I mean, I'm getting more skeptical about quote-unquote offers the older I get just because I think so many of them are not committable or not true or any variety of things. Exactly, exactly. No, I agree. I'm trying to – I did a quick Google – yeah, Jackson – was it Jackson Davis? I thought it was much further back. Oh that. my goodness! I had, yeah, he he did go to Butler. I think okay, that's I thought him. It was more, as a sophomore, so he would have been 2013. He, his senior year in high school would have been 2014. I thought it was further back than that, but that would that's I think that's who it was. Um, you know, and here's a footnote to that. I think that's the kid that wound up in the OVC, I want to say Eastern Kentucky. I know this because I've covered the OVC for Blue Ribbon, and he popped up, and I, I, I want to say it was Eastern Kentucky, and they raved about him, about how he'd done this and that, and had these big rebound games in the past, and 
you know, might be yeah. the best newcomer in the in the OVC, and he didn't amount to much there either. He averaged he averaged uh, in two years at Butler, he averaged one point eight points. One year at, OV, at Eastern Kentucky, he averaged eight point two points and uh, four point seven rebounds. And may have gotten hurt too. Yeah. So speaking of big men from the past, with I'm not going to say Vanderbilt ties, but Vanderbilt played against this guy. Did you hear about the news? Of Chris Marcus is passing today. He, of course, yes. back in the day was a huge big man at Western Kentucky. I mean, he was just I, I saw him on the street one time. He was just a monster of a human being. I think he had Sean Williams told me because he covered him. He had a stress fracture in his foot that kind of wrecked his career. But I was very sad to see the news of that. Marcus was a kid that back his first two years in Western. We were all going, how in the world did Western get a kid like that? And and everybody thought he was a future factor on the NBA level and maybe a star. Yeah, I remember him very well just from, you know, following college hoops, being a local kid. I think Vanderbilt actually played him twice at least. Um, so, yeah, just it was one of those names you just forget the guy existed and then you see it and then they flash the picture of him. And he was just – he was a mountain of a man. He wasn't one of these – Seven foot slender guys. He was he was a he was a big dude. Yeah, I'm gonna guess he was probably seven foot, maybe two sixty five, two seventy, and not a lot of wasted weight on that frame, from what I remember. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and he was one of those guys. You know, back when the NBA valued big men, you figured he was a definitely a, uh, a future NBA player. Yeah, I think he led the country in rebounding once or twice. Oh, really? Okay, I don't remember yeah. that. Uh, if not, I think he was close. I want to say I read that in his obituary uh, online today. But let's talk about a couple of the stories you did. The worst Scott story you did at The Athletic last week was a terrific read. Folks, I hope we'll subscribe to The Athletic and get that for itself. But give me your reflections on that story and maybe some tidbits that didn't make the story or things that stood out to you before or after that story. Yeah, well, if you um, if you're not a subscriber, you can you, you, you there's a 90 day free trial if you want to read that story. Um, it was published last week. Yeah, I had a lot of fun doing it. You know, um, it's a uh, obviously for those of us that are a little bit older and follow follow Vanderbilt sports, it's it's a signature moment in the history of Vanderbilt athletics. And you know, from the outside looking in, when I was telling a colleague about it, and it didn't seem like a big deal. It's like, uh, so you mean a college baseball team? won a game in the last day of the season to finish 14 and 16 and make an eight team common conference tournament. When you look at it like that, it's not a big deal, but just knowing Tim Corbin and, and how he talks about that game and, and what a big deal it was for that program. Like I, I asked him point blank. I said, you know, you've been to, you've won two world series. You, you've been to, you know, four college world series, all this stuff is the worst Scott swing, the, the biggest in the history of your program. He says, yes, for what it did for, for building the program and all that. And, um, just had a lot of fun talking to my, my favorite interview was Eric Back. You know, I, I got to know Eric pretty well when he was there. Kind of lost touch over the years, although it's kind of a funny, sort of a funny story here. I do remember when, um, I'm sure you do, when Michigan came to town a few years ago to, to face your alma mater, Lipscomb. Uh, no, I did not. You don't remember that? Did not okay. recall that. So I, I, I do I, not follow my alma mater in baseball very much. In fact, my the extent of my following is basically – when they play Vanderbilt every year at uh, yeah at the Sounds Park, so I um, you know like I said I got I had you know backage pretty well I hadn't spoken in several years and I was told my son Gabe's fifteen now so he was probably about twelve at the time I said hey or was thirteen was a couple years ago I said let me text Eric backage tell him we're coming I want to say hi to him after a game I text him he didn't get back to me I'm like no big deal he's a busy coach whatever my son's like I thought you knew the coach I was like I do but it's no big deal so. You know, don't think anything of it. And then I t and I was in Omaha last year, but I didn't see Eric or anything like that. So I text Eric when I'm doing the story. I said, hey, I'd love to catch up to you for the story. And then he says, sure, anytime. And then he texts me right back. He's like, ah, oh. he goes, I just see my text didn't go through to you. So like he had actually texted me back about the lip screen. He said, oh, yeah, I'll leave you some tickets. Can't wait to catch up and see you. So I showed it to my son just to prove that I, in fact, do, did know this guy. But it's kind of a slightly humorous story there. At least I thought it was funny. But uh Talking to Eric was was the best part. He got and if you saw his quotes in there, he got so fired up talking about that moment. He was a first year, 23 year old assistant on that staff. And one great thing, you know, we all know about how the, the camaraderie of this program and how tight the guys are. 
you know, I, I, I reached out to back and he's just like two days ago, I was on a zoom call with Warner Jones, Matt Bushman, Gil Kim, Tony Mancellino, like literally with eight or nine guys from that team, just talking about old days. So like, here's the head coach at Michigan, you know, talking to a bunch of former players from a 2003 team and back said this, he goes, it was the most excited I've ever been on the field as a coach. He goes, I, he goes, maybe you put that clinching the college world series last year at Michigan, but those would be on equal footing. So you got a guy who's been the head coach, took Michigan to its first college world series in what, 30 years. And he's putting a, that, that worth Scott game on equal footing. Um, and he was fun to talk to and, you know, worth Scott, great dude. And, and w- one of the things that I thought made the story better, Tim Corbin told me that, um, I'm drawing a blank on his net. Fred, was it Fred Corral? The, um, Yes. Tennessee pitching coach at the time. Cause I said like, what did you do afterwards? Did, you know, you were a young coach and we remember Corbs used to be a lot more, I don't know, exuberant, you know? And I said, did you, you know, jump in the dog pile, whatever he goes, well, I celebrated. And then I went over and I just remember Fred, he called Freddie Corral could not have been more gracious, could not have been whatever. And, you know, I, I thought to try and get in touch with Luke Hochaver or, or Delmonico, but you know, you know, figure those guys. And I didn't really have a, way of getting in touch with either one of them so but just i would had pretty much almost done my story and i just googled freddie corral well he's the assistant coach at missouri and most college coach especially basketball and baseball uh, basketball and football if you go to the website there it'll have their you know email but it'll just say like recruiting at missouri or you know it won't have specific emails so i emailed them and i introduced myself and said here's the story i'm doing um i know it's my you know bring up bad memories but if you want to talk if you have a few minutes i'd love to talk to you about this for the story and i just sent the email a blind email he called me 10 minutes later and he was could not have been nicer or more gracious remembered every detail about the game he got great quotes from the tennessee standpoint and one interesting thing was i always remember the story and i was at the game but i was with my daughter who was young and you know don't remember a lot of the details before we scott's home run Warner Jones went in for a hard slide that a lot of people, there was a debate about whether it was um, interference and all that. And, and then he's like, nope. He said, our shortstop came back and said, I just slept. It wasn't interference. So that was one interesting nugget there. A couple other things that, you know, if you read the story, you knew this, but that that 2003 team opened with Justin Verlander uh, uh, at Old Dominion, which is just incredible that he was uh, at Old Dominion throwing 96 and through a complete game there. But I think my favorite quote was from Rucker Taylor, who was on first base and, you know, a lot of the theme was, you know, did you know the ball was gone, all that. And he's like, well, I'm running towards, obviously I'm on first thinking I got to score. I don't know where the ball is. And then as I'm approaching second base, I see their shortstop and he remembered the kid's name. I just saw the look on his face and the look of dejection and I knew it was gone. And I thought that was just a great quote right there. So, you know, a lot of good stuff. Um, One thing that I didn't, couldn't get in there from Matt Bushman that I thought was pretty funny. He's just like, as I, something about like years later i was driving by hawkins for the game it recurred to me it occurred to me that i actually got the win he's like i gave up the run that we might have lost but i was like it's a great moment and everyone talks about worth scott but hey i was the winning pitcher so i thought that was kind of funny so um yeah just just fun to talk to those guys it was obviously a, a big moment in the program and they're they were all really great to talk to the 04 team was the first one that i really covered i started the site in january of 03 and spent my spring just trying to figure this out and call football recruits and all those things. So I did not watch any baseball games that year with the exception of that game. I went to that game and was in the stands. Uh, I didn't bother to get a media pass to, to watch where Scott hit that home run. So that's the only game I saw. But I really enjoyed those times. That team, Bushman was a funny guy. Tony Mancellino was one of the nicest kids I've ever covered. Eric Backich was one of the nicest guys I've ever covered. I liked he and Derek Johnson a lot. And, of course, I was really about the only one covering them at the time. The Tennessean didn't do much. And so I would go to a lot of games. And after the game, it's a lot different now. It's a little bit more corporate, and there's a lot more demands on everyone's time. But I would a lot of times just sit around and talk to Corbin and Backich and Derek Johnson off the record about stuff really enjoyed the company of those guys. They were all very kind to me. That staff at that time, Tim was really high strung, as you know. Backage was kind of cut out of that same mold. DJ was the guy who was more even keeled, but it was an interesting mix of guys at that time. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, Backage, 
you know, deserves a lot of credit. It's Tim Corbin's program. He recruited those kids. Derek Johnson had a great reputation recruiting those kids, but Backage was also a great recruiter. And, you know, he made some, he had a lot, he had offers to leave earlier to mid-major programs. He, you know, he went to Maryland and it didn't work out there. He left for Michigan. I think Maryland gave, you know, promised him some facility stuff that they didn't deliver and, you know, went to Michigan, sort of a, you know, Michigan has that name brand university, at least at the time, you know, had really been struggling in baseball. And I was kind of surprised that he wasn't enjoying more success. His teams were never bad, but, you know, Maryland and Michigan are two difficult jobs. So I was really happy to see him break through last year. He is, he is just genuinely a good dude. If you watch the college world series, his, his, his interviews in the dugout during the, during the games were great. Um, he stands for, in my opinion, all the right things. And he's, he's a, just a good, good dude, good coach. And, uh, uh, like I said, real happy. And he was, could not have been, could have been, could not have been more fun to talk to for the story. In a way, what he did at Maryland was as impressive as what he did at Michigan, because Michigan, at least in the eighties was a college basketball or college baseball powerhouse. And it has had some flashes here and there. Maryland, I don't think they'd been to the NCAA tournament in like 30-something years before he took them there. I don't think he ever took them there. I think he, they went the year after he left. Did they he go the year after he left? Okay, well, he recruited they had, they all had those guys. They had a lot of success after he left. I think he got the ball rolling there. He started recruiting like crazy. Yeah. And then, you know, their coach, then they haven't been – I mean, now they've gone to the Big Ten, which hurt them. But they haven't really been good since since that few years after he left. You know, so he he left that program stocked with some talent. Mitch, speaking of the athletic, you have a story coming up soon. I will just let you take it from there and explain what you will about that. Yeah, it's a, it's will be tomorrow. So if you publish, we're doing this Monday, so I, I I'm, it's going to be published tomorrow morning. So I'll give you uh, I'll give you the people I talked to, Chris, and see if you could guess who, what the story is about. Bobby Johnson, a lawyer in New York. Kevin Warren, the Big Ten Commissioner, Earl Bennett, and Sean McDonough. Now, I told you what it's about before. So, if I'll be honest, if I told you those were the people, would you have been a guess? Well, it, it's hard to say now because, like you said, you have biased my answer. I mean, okay, Sean McDonough obviously was the CBS play-by-play guy, and Vanderbilt ESPN. wasn't on, or excuse me, yeah. ESPN. Vanderbilt was not on TV that many times, if you want to go that angle. And Earl Bennett, I think everybody remembers what he was famous for. Um, well, he was famous for a lot of things, but one of the few televised games they had back then was that game in the Swamp. Yeah, so it is, it, it's, it's about the excessive celebration game, but there's a... I think a pretty unique angle on that game. So I'll leave it at that. I hope everyone reads it tomorrow. Again, if you're not a subscriber, it's a 90 day free trial. Uh, but again, I talked to Bobby Johnson, Earl Bennett, a lawyer in New York, the commissioner of the big 10 and Sean McDonough. I cannot wait to read that one. <laughs> Thank you. I'm looking for, I'm, I'm looking forward to the reaction. Like it's one of those things that you're with me. Like, it's a fun story to tell. I think the story worked. I mean, a lot of times when you're writing stories, you have these ideas and the story just doesn't work. But I, I think I think it works. And I've shared it with some people who don't really know much about it, to be sure. Like if they thought it was a good story, like the idea and they, I got the thumbs up. Yeah, this is this is a good story. You should pursue this. So uh, uh, I hope, hope you like it. Well, the angle that you told me off podcast was enough to pique my interest so yeah. I, th- I think it will knowing you I think it will deliver but I will see thank that you. tomorrow with the rest of the world thank you let's go to the mailbag which is sponsored by Mark Jen of simply a fan Mark organizes road trips to sporting events across the country and is doing so for several Vanderbilt baseball road series when play resumes hopefully next year go to simplyafan.com get more information Tell him you heard about his business here on the podcast. And Arbor Door says, do either of you see any likely scenarios where amateur sports, and he specifies AAU, college, summer league baseball, uh, other elite high school travel programs and tournaments, where those things resume this summer, could it vary state to state? I mean, I think it could vary state to state, especially when you the, the lower down you get. It could vary, uh, you know, and uh, we haven't talked in two weeks. My stance in this is like my always answer is I don't 
No, I mean, there's so many, you know, every day you read something different, there's different states doing different things. And uh, we, we just don't know, you know, there seems to be a little bit more momentum. There, there's colleges that are planning on opening up in, in this in the fall. Uh, I, I don't know, I'd be surprised, very surprised if there's anything high level at, um, athletics this summer. That being said, there's momentum for the NBA and the NHL to do stuff at, you know, centralized locations. So I just, I just don't know. I'm not, I'm not the source of, uh, I'm not the, uh, the, the go-to guy for this stuff. Is it just me? Maybe with the NFL draft, that's where focus was on, but it seems like to me that MLB has just gone really quiet on potential scenarios and things like that in recent days. Yeah. Maybe it's just, it's not getting out there, you know, uh, you know, just people aren't breaking the news or like you said, they're sidetracked by the NFL or maybe there's just been no, no momentum or there's been nothing because we don't just, we just don't know. It's just, it's a unique time. And, you know, we can sit here in Nashville. I can sit here and, you know, Bellevue and Nashville and, you know, I don't know anyone specifically who's sick. It doesn't affect me, but so then you think, Oh, we get back to normal soon. But then you, you places huge metropolitan areas, especially in New York, the things are still not really going well. So it's just, it's, the, the, it's a big country. There's so many different population bases and the demographics and everything. It's just, it's, 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 it's going to be difficult to figure this thing out. Yeah. We do know some people, we, we know a couple that we are acquainted with from church that got struck by the virus, just found out this weekend. So it's hitting a little closer to home now. Some things that were interesting, I think, I think that the testing, there's some debate on whether the tests that are out there are completely accurate. To me, that's where I, I pinned a lot of my hope on these things. I thought, well, if you can test people and you can pretty easily quarantine a population, you know, say for Major League Baseball where it's players and not too many coaches and broadcasters, you could really limit that. I thought, well, that seems reasonable to do. But if the tests aren't accurate, then that's a whole other thing. I, th- I think in that case, it's hard to do it. Number two, and my wife brought this up last night. She said, you know, we still don't really know what this thing is. And for people who don't know, I think they've heard it on the program. My wife's a nurse practitioner. So she's pretty wise about these things. But she said, you know, at first it wasn't supposed to really hit kids that hard. And uh, now that's not the case. And it just still a lot of variables. Even, I guess it's been two months or so since this has been a thing in the U.S. And just, as she pointed out, still a lot of stuff we don't know. Yeah, that's why I'm always, you know, I'm not trying to dodge the questions. I mean, if if, if people who are really well-versed in this stuff and far more knowledgeable don't know, you know, how are a bunch of, you know, schmoes like us supposed to answer those questions? You know, we'll, we'll do our best. We can throw out guesses, but it's just so many, you know, as everyone says, Chris, in these uncertain times. I don't know. I mean, state by state, I think it's going to get approached that way. I don't know if you could. I mean, to me, doing this in a place like in Atlanta, like AAU tournaments, I went to one to watch my niece play down in Atlanta a few summers back. And it just doing it. I mean, they had this huge convention center and they had maybe 40 floors set up inside it. And you had just thousands of people going in and out. To me, doing something like that is just. I don't know. It's just very high risk. I would have to think if they did anything, it would help to be smaller events in more rural areas that that would be maybe the place to start it, from a pragmatic standpoint. But like you said, who knows? Um, next one from VU Titans, starting with the year 2000, who would you rank as the third best quarterback for Vanderbilt behind Cutler and Shermer? So post Zolman, um, well, wait, Zolman played in 2000, did he not? Well, it's, it would be Zolman. So let's just say after Zolman. Let's not include Zolman in this. Okay. Um, one thing, Vanderbilt's had a lot of long, you know, the quarterback, this is going to sound weird, the quarterback position either, has either been in good, really good shape or not in good shape at all. You know what I mean? Like it's Cutler for four years, Shermer for three and a half. I, we've talked about this. I'd say Chris Nixon, that if he – if he doesn't get hurt, he he'll go down. He goes down as one of the better quarterbacks in, in Vanderbilt history. Um, so uh, I, I'm trying, you know, Jordan Rogers. I guess maybe you know, we've talked about Jordan Rogers. Maybe Jordan, you'd have to say Jordan Rogers started two bowl games. Um, 
so I, based on winning and productivity, I'd probably say Jordan Rogers slightly over Chris Nixon. I would too. Let's see. So it was Zolman in 2000. And I think 2001 also. Cutler from two, three, four, and five, he was a starter. Nixon was a starter in 06. And most of 07, part of 07. Well, it was basically Nixon and like Mackenzie Adams when right. Nixon was hurt for, from like for 06, 07, 08. And then they went Larry Smith in the bowl game. Right. And he held on to the job for a couple of years. It wasn't that productive. Then Rodgers took over, Jordan Rodgers, in the Georgia game of 2011, held that through 2012. I'm sorry? Yeah, you're right. Jordan Rodgers for two years, basically, then Carter Carter Samuels, or a year and a half, then Carter Samuels for a year. Yep. He he got hurt, and then it was a a mess for a few years until Shermer seized it. Yeah, you had a mix of Robinette, McCrary, and uh, Wade Freeback. That next yeah. year. And then McCrary, I think, started 15? McCrary started the first part of the season. Shermer's, so that And then Shermer took uh, over. That's right. 15. Yeah. And then he had Shermer for three and a half years, and then he had the mess that was last year. So, really, the discussion, the only guys that were really productive for any stretch of time were Zolman, Rogers, and... Carter Samuels, and I would probably go in that order. And Nixon. And oh yeah, Nixon, who's kind of a, a wild card because you look back at do you remember the Kentucky game? Sure. I remember listening on the radio. Yeah. No, look, that was a game that I think got maybe a little bit out of hand. And when that happens, you can rack up bigger numbers. But he ran and threw the ball really well. And I always say this um, you pay attention to what guys do at the early part of their career, and that was his first year as a starter, because you know, for the most part, you're going to have some mistakes. So you say, was there an upside there that counters it? And boy, I thought he really had some. And then the shoulder injury happened, and he just never was the same after that. Yeah, I was. we've talked about it, I think, a couple of weeks ago. I've always been a huge Nixon guy, so uh, he stayed healthy. I think we agree with Zolman. If we're going to include Zolman in this, he's number three behind those guys. Uh, if not, I think it's Rogers. Mitch, anything else today before we end the podcast? I think not. I've uh, talked about the two stuff on the, my two stories on the athletics. So you get me. Let me get my plugs in there. And your Twitter handle, please. Uh, at Mitch Light. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, sir. Enjoy it, Chris. You bet. So did I. He is Mitch Light. I'm Chris Lee. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast. Should have at least one, maybe two more episodes coming your way later this week.